Good morning and welcome everyone. I'm Tom Boley, Chief Market Strategist at EarningsBeats.com, and this is Trading Places Live. It is Tuesday, March 24th, 2020. We are pre-recording this Trading Places Live. Want to make sure you uh, realize that currently. Futures are pointing to a very solid open, but we do know how things can change very quickly in this environment. So uh, where the market opens and what it does in the ensuing six and a half hours is anyone's guess. Uh, but we'll take a look at some more probable scenarios based on history during the show here. Um, before we get into uh, the charts and what happened yesterday, let's go through uh, today's agenda for you. Uh, we will start off with that daily market recap from yesterday. Uh, it was not a very good day, uh, but it, we got a little bit of buying at the end of the day, so we did close off the lows. We'll show you those charts in just a second. Uh, then we'll go through uh, and do um, talking technically. Um, and in talking technically today, what I really want to do is take a look at um, the current environment and really the only other two environments that I think are similar, at least in my investing time. And that would, was back in 2008 during the financial crisis and in 1987 uh, for the market crash. And so looking at those two could give us maybe a glimpse into to what we might expect. I mean, all three of these events were were very different, um, and there's no guarantee that they'll that this one will react the way the last two did. But at least I think it gives us something, you know, some education to be armed with as we look at a potential bounce in the market. Uh, we'll go through and take a look at scooter reports. Um, yeah, scooters give us an opportunity to look at uh, different securities on a relative strength basis. So I want to talk a little bit about that, maybe take a look at a few stocks there. Uh, earnings spotlight today, just wanted to go through and uh, show you a few upcoming reports, maybe several, depending on the time. Uh, but we'll go through some of the bigger reports that'll be out later this week. Uh, I, I can tell you a lot of companies have withdrawn guidance. It's going to be guidance. It's going to be very interesting to see um, what these companies say about the next quarter. Because usually, you know, when they're giving their reports, they provide a little bit of information about the upcoming quarter, but I don't know whether they're, you know, going to have that information. So it's gonna be a, a, very, in, a very interesting time as these companies report earnings uh, to see what they have to say, if anything, about the future. Um, and then we'll go into a couple of upgrades and downgrades and then wrap it up with three you must see. If we bounce, and it looks like on the open we're going to bounce, I'd like to see a little bit more than just a gap up and then sell off. I'd like to actually see some sustained buying for a period of time. And if we do, I think that's going to be a really important um, uh, view of the market to see what is being bought and so forth. So I, it's uh, there are a few groups that have been leading on a relative basis. Well, there are a lot of groups, but the three primary groups that have been leading on a relative basis, I'm going to talk about those in the three you must see. And these are three groups that I would really watch on the bounce to see if they not only lead during the weakness, but also are being favored as we start the bounce. That could give us some really good clues going forward. So uh, anyway, you'll want to stick around for the three you must see at the end. All right, let's go ahead and uh, jump into the daily market recap. It was not a very good day yesterday, but at this point, I think we're all getting a little bit numb. Uh, we're seeing the same thing over and over again. It uh, reminds me of the movie Groundhog Day with Bill Murray, where you just kind of wake up and you start the same process all over again. Uh, but here you can see Dow Jones Industrial Average down 3% yesterday, 582 points. As I mentioned, it did come off the lows very late in the session. We were down over 900 points on the Dow. The S&P 500 down almost 3%, uh, 67 points. Now uh, clearly down below that 2300 level. And if you recall, the lows back in uh, December of 2018 on the S&P 500 were about the 2350 level. So we're now solidly beneath that level. On a weekly candlestick, I'd actually like to see a big reversal. So maybe the futures and a little bit of follow through, maybe we can get that on the weekly chart. That remains to be seen, obviously, as we have to wait till Friday's close for that. The NASDAQ uh, down 18 points. Look at it on a relative basis, pretty strong. And while we see the Dow and the S&P clearly going to new lows, it does look like the NASDAQ is trying to uh, form a base. Um, again, I'd like to see a little follow through if we do get this open, nice open today. I'd like to see some follow through. Uh, mid caps, um, very weak again, down 3%. 
Uh, small caps, though, on a relative basis, held up better yesterday, uh, losing just 1.5%. But it's been a rough road for mid caps and small caps over the past month, even longer, really. These are two groups that have been underperforming for a while. As far as the individual sectors go, there were two sectors that finished in positive territory yesterday. Communication services, and this has been actually one of the areas, if you don't follow relative strength, the XLC relative to the S&P 500 has broken out to a multi-month, uh, might even be more than a year, I'd have to go back and look at the chart, but uh, we're getting a breakout on a relative basis. So you can see on an absolute basis, we're still going lower, but you can see the consolidation not breaking to new lows while the S&P does break to new lows. So again, it's relative strength, not absolute strength. But when we bounce, does that relative strength continue? That's gonna be a really important question uh, that we'll need to see answered. Discretionary stocks. Consumer discretionary has not been a very good area rel on a relative basis. Yesterday it was. Again, we'd like to see more of that. As far as weakness yesterday, again, Groundhog Day, energy. Energy has just been beaten up beyond uh, what I could have imagined coming. I mean, this group back at the beginning of the year was uh, the XLE was at $60. We closed yesterday at $23.57, which is a full 60% drop since the beginning of the year. Huge drop in energy. Financials also weak yesterday, losing almost 6%. Real estate, another big drop down about 5.5%. So it was not a good day. Obviously, things are a little rough here. Um, we're going to hopefully get a little bounce and let's see if, if it sticks and if the bulls can help, you know, make, uh, you know, just kind of build a little bit on, uh, on what we're hopefully going to see at the open and what we saw into the close yesterday. Um, cause I really would like to see a base kind of form. And at least if we can bounce, we really up until now haven't had a significant bounce where we even have, have an opportunity really to form a base. So maybe this will be the time. Uh, there are some good news, or there is some good news out uh, relative to the coronavirus, and we'll talk about that in just a second. Uh, looking at the 10-year Treasury yield, you can see uh, the close yesterday, we were down 17 basis points, so we finished at 0.76. Last time I looked this morning, maybe 15 minutes ago, I believe we were up about three basis points, 0.79, so a little bit of money rotating out of Treasuries, sending the yield higher. There's always that inverse relationship always 100% of the time. If, we, if you see the yield going down, that means prices, treasury prices are going up and vice versa. So if the yield is going up, treasury prices are going down. I like to see the yield going up because that means treasury prices are going down. If treasury prices are going down, that means treasuries are being sold, proceeds of which are available to go into the stock market. So it's rotation that I look for. Well, unfortunately, what we've been seeing is rotation the other way. We've been seeing a lot of folks, because of all the fear, pouring into the safety of treasuries. Treasury prices have been going up. Yields have been coming down rapidly. But we have seen at least a bounce in the treasury yield. To me, what this says is that there is a building of cash. A lot of folks are getting out of treasuries, but they're not committing it to equities. And so, again, we'll see a little bit of that today at the open, hopefully, um, and we'll see whether or not they stick. Um, economic reports out today. We do have the uh, March PMI that will be coming out uh, this morning at 945. New home sales will be out later today. That's gonna be an interesting report. But as far as the PMI goes, the uh, composite flash is estimated at 44.2. February was 49.6. So the market is beginning to price in, well, the market's already been pricing in weak economic data, but now we're actually gonna start seeing some of this weakness uh, coming in. I think we're going to see a lot more of it this week, and it'll just continue to uh, accelerate, I think, over the next few weeks. March PMI manufacturing, 43 is the estimate. February was 50.8. So looking for a sharp slowdown in manufacturing. And even March PMI services, 43.9. The February level was 49.4. And February's for the services was down four points from January. So we're looking at uh, the March PMI services being down about 10 points from where we were back in January. So very, very quick drop in uh, manufacturing services and so forth. And that's why we've seen such a quick drop in the stock market. Stock market is telling us that we are going to see a major economic slowdown. And I think we're all uh, at this point realizing that that's what we're going to see. 
Some of the top stories this morning, we do have futures hitting limit up. So across the board, uh, the Dow, S&P, and NASDAQ all looking to move higher by 5%. So they got locked at that level. Of course, we could open higher than that. Um, and in fact, I will take a quick look and see if I can tell you where we are at this point by looking at the spider. The spider is up 4.66%. So while we have a lock limit on the futures on the, the S&P and the Dow and, it, and the NASDAQ, the ETFs continue to trade. So like the spider that tracks the S&P 500. So we can get a, a good look at where it's uh, currently trading. So that's up 4.66% uh, to 233.33. That's up from yesterday's close at 222.95. Okay, let's take a look next um, at the Fed. Okay, so the Fed has basically backstopped everything. They have now come out and announced that they will provide unlimited QE. So folks that were upset because of all the QE back after the financial crisis, well, prepare yourself because this is gonna be even greater. Um, I have a feeling that this QE is gonna swamp the QE that we saw with the financial crisis before this is all said and done. And I don't think it's gonna be in one stage. I think that the economy probably is gonna need multiple stages of this going forward. So just prepare yourself for that right now, unlimited QE. And you can say what you want about QE and how it's gonna have a terrible impact on the dollar or on debt, whatever, blah, blah, blah. The bottom line is when the stock market starts moving higher, I mean, we've got 2009 to 2020 as an example. When the Fed gets behind the economy, you know, you don't fight the Fed. There's an old saying, an old adage, don't fight the Fed. When the Fed starts getting behind things and helping the market, you can scream that it's not fair and they shouldn't do it, but they're going to do it. And they're likely to help the market. So at some point, when the market feels like enough is enough, we're, we're gonna base, we're gonna bottom, and then we're gonna start to turn back higher. Um, how exactly the shape that this takes, well, that's open to interpretation for everyone. We'll talk a little bit more about that in just a bit. Um, other good news, Italy. Um, for the second day in a row, we've seen new cases and deaths drop. Thank goodness. Um, so it looks like their uh, peak um, is at 43 days, assuming that this is the peak. Now, if all of a sudden, next couple of days, we start seeing things shoot higher again, then we've got a problem and probably the market will tell us. But at least for now, it looks like Italy has peaked at 43 days. That was the exact same number of days for South Korea. So if we, in the US, look at that as maybe where we're heading, I think we're at day 29. So we would be looking at two more weeks of this escalation before we would peak based on what's happened in South Korea and Italy. Now, you might say, well, we haven't maybe taken enough measures. That certainly is all up for argument. But just giving you the numbers and how they relate in some of the other countries, um, it does at least appear that we're getting a top here in Italy. Uh, more and more countries coming up in support of postponing the Olympics. Duh. I mean, I, I can't imagine having the Olympics and having people from all over the world come together right now. Uh, that just doesn't make any sense. So I, in my opinion, there's no, no doubt that they're going to uh, be postponing it. Uh, Twitter, one of the latest companies coming out to withdraw guidance. I mean, we've seen so many of these companies doing it, but Twitter added to the list. And then Gilead wins orphan drug status for, and I'm going to butcher the name, Remdesivir, um, which is a drug uh, for the coronavirus. So they have won orphan drug status for that. All right, um, let's... Um, Take a look now in uh, talking technically. I want to go through and look at the S&P 500. This is 1987. So this is an opportunity for us maybe just to sit back and collect our breaths and say, okay, what happened in the last two moves to the downside? Yesterday when I was doing my show over at Earnings Beats, um, and I do these shows every morning, 9 to 9.30, either at Earnings Beats or uh, here at Stock Charts TV. Um, don't do them on Friday, but Monday through Thursday. But when you look back at history, um, the only two periods, when I looked at a daily chart going back the last 40 years, the only two periods that show the acceleration in the market to the downside, like we have seen in this period, was 1987 and 2008. 
So I think comparing 2020 to any other periods in the last 40 years, besides those two, is probably just wasting our time. Um, just because the selling was so much more, so much heavier, so much more drastic, the fear was so much crazier. Um, I think we need to look at those periods. So here's 1987. And you can argue, okay, do you, for a Fibonacci, do you start at the very top? Do you start where the real escalation began? I'm gonna start where the real escalation began because especially when you look at 2008, which where we were already in a bear market, you could really have a, a tough time trying to figure out where in the heck to, to draw these Fibonacci uh, lines from. But I'm gonna go ahead and start beginning of October because that, in my opinion, is when we really began this huge move to the downside. Um, and it started at 3.30, roughly, and went down to just under 2.20. So a little more than one-third, roughly one-third, 33%. That's about where we are right now on the S&P 500. So here was the drop. And you can see the initial bounce before we had another big move down. The initial bounce was at that first Fibonacci level, 38.2%. We went back down almost to the low, went back up couldn't get through once this is what i refer to as a reaction high after all the selling where do we go when the buying finally kicks in here's where we went and so that level is not only a fibonacci level but now it becomes a price resistance level which is around the 260 area we went all the way back down to 230 which was about another 11 12 percent and then right back up again you can see the volatility we are not out of the woods in terms of volatility and if you're in the habit of chasing moves one way or the other, you could find yourself constantly being behind the uh, eight ball here. You wanna really be careful. Um, you know, I think taking positions is gonna be difficult because of the volatility. You wanna keep a tight stop, but at the same time, you are going to, you know, your, your emotions are gonna take a toll on you as the market goes back and forth. So what I would suggest, because the market is moving so fast, I think a lot of folks like to say, wow, we're gonna, I'm gonna make a fortune, I'm gonna get in and margin, I'm gonna do this and that. If the market goes against you, you can lose a ton in a very short period of time. I've seen you know, some traders use leveraged ETFs and then go into margin. And I'm like, really? You don't need that in this kind of environment. Get it right, you're gonna make money. Get it wrong and you're gonna you know, lose a fortune if you're using leverage or margin or both. So. I would suggest, and it's just me, to be very careful and maybe try to build a position on a rally. If you're thinking about shorting the next move down, maybe as we rally, think about finding a, few, a couple of levels, two, three levels, where you say, okay, I'm gonna take a shot here. If it continues to run up, I'm gonna take another shot here, and then maybe a third shot or something like that. If you only get one and it goes back down, you're making money. If it goes up a second or a third, and Let's say we get a V bottom. I mean, I don't think we're gonna see a V bottom, but anything's possible. You wanna be able to minimize that risk if you're gonna to try to short this. So pick your spots. Here we go, 1987, you can see. This was a pretty big, important level. We went back down a second time to test these prior lows. Back up, little head fake, came back down, didn't go all the way down, and then started to break back up above these levels. And I think when you start to see that, that's when you, I think the bottom is in, the market's trying to move higher. It's still gonna be high VIX. It's still gonna be a high volatile, or highly volatile environment. So we're gonna see some false breakdowns. You're gonna to have to have a stomach of steel to trade the market. Or if you're saying, hey, I'm, I'm looking at getting in for the longer term. You know, if you're getting in and you start to see things stabilize, you still might see some, you know, four, five, 7% drops that you're gonna to have to probably weather as we go forward. And some of you may think, you know, this is just gonna be temporary and we're gonna go down again. I don't believe we will. I think we're gonna set a bottom, maybe pierce it once, um, and then I think we're gonna go higher. So I think it's more about the base. Isn't there a song out there? It's all about the base. Um, yeah, that's what I think it is here with the market too. I think we're gonna need to build a base, but up until now it's been, are we ever going to build a base? So let's move on to take a look at the uh, S&P 500 in 2008. Now, if I went back further, the S&P 500 was much higher. So what I did is I took the acceleration to the downside. See how the PPO really accelerates here to the downside? This is what's similar to 2020 and 1987. 
it's that PPO down at the minus seven level. Look at this right here, it was at minus eight. See that? Now we look at it, it's minus seven. So this is really the period that I wanted to focus on. Now, in 2008, we had a continuation. It wasn't just the uh, financial crisis, but there were obviously a lot of other things that followed. We were already in a deep downtrend. We already were, we saw a lot of fear and panic even before we got to this level. So that's why I think 2008 is a little bit more, or excuse me, 2020 is a little bit more like 1987. Because in both of those instances, we were in a secular bull market, and then out of the blue, we took this huge hit. 2008 is a little different. And so there was a lot of things that were done leading to where we went in October. And even though we did go lower, we didn't really go a lot lower. So, I mean, from 850 down to 750, I mean, here was maybe a week where we had a little head fake, a little bit of excess panic, but really another 100 points, maybe 10%. So I think once we establish the base, maybe we go another 10%. But I think at that point, it starts to make more sense to be in on the long side. So let's see if we can create this base. So where are we today? Oh, and before I say it, here's the, here are the bounces. So here's your Fibonacci retracement, 38.2. One day we made it to 50, but basically it was 38.2. Came back up after a double bottom, came back up, tested the area, and then we ended up going lower. And it wasn't until really we get back through that thousand level that I would have felt more comfortable. And that was down the road a bit. So now where are we right now? Well, have we even hit the bottom yet? That's the first question. Yes, we're going to rally at the open. We have seen this before in this downtrend. So I'm not convinced yet that we've put in the bottom. You, you almost need the, the, the print of the rally. That first 38.2% would take us to 2650 on the S&P, which is 400 points from where we are right now. It looks like we're going to get 100 at the open. So you might think, well, we'll never get 400. Well, if you get 100 at the open, get a you know, package from Congress, uh, maybe a couple more days of good news out of Italy. Yeah, I could see 400 points after what we have taken to the downside. So I'm hopeful that this is our bottom, initial main bottom, and that now we are ready to make a push to the upside. Look at the daily PPO, by the way. Just went through minus eight. So we just eclipsed where we were in 1987. We're already past where we were in 2008 in terms of the acceleration of this move to the downside. So let's see if we can get a bounce back to the upside and go from there. All right, let's move on. Uh, I want to talk just for a minute here about the scooter reports. Um, so let's go in. And the big thing I want to do is just point out where you can find these scooters over in the member tools. Um, and it is a very easy way to quickly identify some of the stronger stocks. Now, if you look at some of these stocks, and this is in the large cap in scooter order, not all of these stocks have gone up. In fact, if we take a look at AMD, which is one of the top stocks, and we pull the chart up, you'll see we've been going down. So the high scooter scores don't tell you that this, these are stocks that are going up. What they tell you is that they are stocks that are outperforming other large cap stocks. So any of these companies with a high rating essentially have been outperforming their large cap peers, and they've been doing so over I'm gonna say roughly a five to six month period. Based on the formula and how this is calculated, you could be a horrible company eight months ago, but if in the last six, five, six months, you've really been outperforming, um, you're gonna have a high scooter. So this doesn't always equate to a great long-term company. Keep that in mind. Again, if you look at the formula, it's much, short, much shorter term than that. All right, so I just want to point that out. So large caps, then you've got mid caps you can look at, and then, of course, you can go into the small caps. But that's a great way to start. And, and sometimes just look and see the industry groups, what, where, these, where these companies are. I mean, the fact that Domino's in the restaurant group, of course, Domino's isn't a sit-in restaurant, so at least not in my area. So this is a stock that kind of makes sense. They'll deliver pizza to you. So anyhow, uh, that's it for the scooter reports. Earning spotlight. Um, I wanted to just talk about, let's pull up Nike because Nike is going to be reporting and you can see Nike been in this big downtrend. Um, we have seen the accumulation distribution, which is an indicator that I've been using more often. You can see it moving higher here. Lots of hollow candles. That tells me there's a little accumulation. How does this company respond 
to an earnings report. This is going to be the first test of a really big company, I think, throughout this crisis. So what does Nike have to say about the future and how does the stock market react to an earnings report? I am really not following my strong earnings chart list right now. And anybody who follows me knows that's been my, that's been my trading Bible, if you will. I mean, that's been my go-to. That's where I find my stocks to trade. And literally, the market could care less about what you just did in the last quarter. It's all about what you're going to be doing. And you could have airlines that posted great numbers last quarter. Does that matter right now? No. You know, airlines could be under if they don't get their, their bailout. So you can't look last quarter's earnings really don't help me right now. So I'm looking more at this accumulation distribution and relative strength. These are the two key areas. Um, other earnings that you uh, at least should be aware of coming up, uh, we do have Micron, Paychex, uh, Lululemon later this week. Lululemon, I think, looks pretty interesting. Uh, when you look at it again, big drop, but accumulation distributions near a high. And when you look at it relative to its peers, it's off the charts. It's almost breaking out relative to the S&P, even though it's in one of the worst areas of the market. Clothing and accessories have been horrible. So this will be an interesting report, something to keep in mind as we go throughout the week. Um, as far as upgrades and downgrades, I'm not going to go over any, but what I will do is just show you what I do in coming up with these is I go to briefing.com. Very simple. Uh, when you go in here, calendars, upgrades, downgrades. They have guidance. They have other things you can look at. Very uh, good site to get some information. There's all your upgrades. Got a ton of them this morning. Downgrades. I see here Tesla being upgraded. Uh, and then you can go through the downgrades. So you can get a quick uh, uh, list, Tesla being downgraded, by the way. So we're going to upgrade and a downgrade. But this uh, maybe is a little homework to do before you go into the market. I find it a, a pretty good site to get some information. All right, three you must see. And we're going to go through these kind of quickly. But I wanted to point out the, this is my, my uh, relative strength industries chart list. So I have every industry group relative to the S&P 500. When you pull up a chart list in summary form and then go back a period to the period, which I've used one month, this all started just about a month ago. Here we are. It's March 24th. February 24th was the Monday right after options had expired. And this is when we really began to accelerate to the downside. So this tells us the groups in the last month that have been outperforming. So let's go over them really quickly. First one, uh, I'm going to do the top three. This is the uh, mobile telecommunications. It's going down. So don't think it's going up. It's going down, but on a relative basis, look at the strength in this group. Very, very strong. Uh, let's take a look at uh, the second one, which is toys. You know, everybody at home with their kids, right? Uh, basically staying in their home. I saw reports saying that a lot of toys, video games, and so forth being bought to kind of occupy your time while you're home. Makes sense. So the group's been going down for the most part, but look at the relative strength there. Very, very strong. And then I'm going to end this with the broadline retailers. Um, broadline retail was already doing good. You can see we're not far from breaking out. And this is the area where Amazon lives. So look at that relative strength. If we bounce, do these groups continue to lead? That's going to be a question to watch. All right, everybody have a great day, and we'll be back uh, on Thursday here at Stock Charts TV. Happy trading, everyone.